three times and stops. But I'm going to keep striking the ground until I see complete victory. I'm going to keep striking the ground until I see a complete victory. Come on, let me see your arrows. We're going to strike right here. Give me you, everything else can wait. Give me you, I hope I'm not too late. Lord, give me you, Lord, give me you, Lord, give me you, Lord. Give me you, everything else can wait. Lord, give me you, I hope I'm not too late. Lord, give me you, Lord, give me you, Lord, give me you, Lord.
Come on, let's stand all across this room tonight. Come on, let's lift up the name of the Lord in this house. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be magnified. Come on, somebody lift him up tonight. Come on, lift him up tonight. His name is great and greatly to be praised. There's nobody like our God. If you're thankful for that name tonight, why don't you put your hands together and give him some praise. If you're really thankful, why don't you put your hands together?
Come on, doesn't it feel good to be free? Doesn't it feel good to be washed by the blood of Jesus? Come on, somebody. My God, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Come on, I was waiting all, I was waiting all day for this moment. I was waiting to get in the house of the Lord. I was waiting to lift up my hands. I couldn't wait to shout. I couldn't wait to praise him. Woo! My God. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. My God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God's just been so good. God has been so good to us. God. Woo! When I look back, when I look back and I think things over, I'm blessed. Come on, somebody. You're blessed. When you look back and see where God brought you from. How could you not clap your hands? How could you not lift your voice? Come on, somebody, you're blessed. You're blessed in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. I'm up here for prayer. And how many know that we serve the same God who parted the Red Seas? We serve the same God where Elijah prayed and fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. We serve the same God when the storm was rolling, he said, peace, be still. Come on, we serve that same God tonight. How many of us have a need in this house? If you can just show that by an upraised hand. If God did it then, he could do it now. Come on, somebody, if God did it then, he could do it now. If God was a healer then, he can heal you now. If God can bless people back then, he could bless you now. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just lift our hands in the presence of the Lord. Come on, it's time to ask in faith nothing wavering lord we come before you god we know that without you nothing can be done but god we know with you all things are possible god we're asking that you move god whatever we need god lord i'm asking you quickly go god i'm asking you dispatch angelic hosts to help us god to bring healing jesus lord and i thank you for all the things you're going to do tonight hallelujah thank you jesus somebody clap your hands Hallelujah, Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. My God. Woo! Let's clap our hands one more time. Come on, let's clap it like we mean it. Let's clap it like we mean it. Let's clap it like he's the one who saved us. Let's clap like he's the one who redeemed us. Let's clap our hands because he died on the cross for us. Let's clap our hands because we know all things are possible. Come on, somebody, let's clap our hands and let's shout because we know we serve a God who answers by fire. We serve a God who's able to heal you. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, I'm excited. I am excited for tonight. I'm telling you, God's going to do something tonight. I just feel it. God's going to do something tonight. Woo, you can make your way back to your seats. I'm going to jump in the Tuesday night announcements. Please join us this Thursday at 4.45 p.m. for Kids and Youth Outreach. Yes, VBS is only 16 days away, and Impact is not long after that. I think it's like a month and 12 days or something like that. Let's reach the youth of our city. Amen? For more information, please see the Hammonds. Search for Truth Bible Study class happens every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Amen. At the Ramirez residence. Heat and Kia will be meeting at the church this Friday at 7 p.m. Early morning prayer will be at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday. Everybody say Financial Peace University. Financial Peace University is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Outreach this week will be meeting Saturday afternoon at 1.30 p.m. That's right, 1.30 p.m. Mark it on your calendar. Family prayer is Thursday night at 7 p.m. Street ministry every Friday and Saturday night at 7.30 p.m. Open enrollment for Rock Christian Academy has begun. Amen. If you would like more information or to sign your sign students up, please see Sister Sloss for more information. Tonight is the night. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, tonight is the night. Tonight is the night. Heat will be continuing their cool fundraiser. Yes. Right after service, sunglasses are being sold for $1, ice cream and lily dillies for $1, and chili top tacos in a bag with a drink for $4. Mm -hmm. Be cool, bring some money and help support Heat and Impact 2020. Amen, and now a special announcement from Women's Life Ministry. Let's give it up, come on, let's give it up for Women's Life. Woo! 
Good evening, church. I'm up here to talk about woman life. Woman life and Sister Kenneck will be having a testimony night on July 18 at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. I'm charging all ladies that is in this room tonight to come out and give you testimony. We all have a testimony. Don't make the enemy lie to us. Don't make fear tell you you don't have a testimony. We all have a testimony. Fear will tell us you don't have a testimony. Don't go in that place. Don't, don't just be quiet, silent. That's what fear tells us. He tells us to silent. Don't speak. I'll speak for you. And then he doesn't speak because he doesn't have a voice. He whisper because he's whispering the lies that he's telling us. Nobody can hear what he's saying. To say that's a lie. He's telling you a lie. So he whispered it into our ears and said, don't go. Don't go tell a testimony. You don't have a testimony. Nobody don't want to listen to what you have to say. That's fear. I'm talking from experience. But you know what I tell fear? I tell fear, I'm no longer a slave of your fear. I get out of your cave. I come out of the cave of fear. So come on out, lady, and give your testimony. We all have a testimony in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give it up for Women's Life Ministry. I'm telling you, my God, something's going to happen that night. You better mark it in your calendar, ladies. I'm telling you, it's, this is the coolest thing is because there's so many things for us to do here at the church. It's so easy to just plug in and just be at home with all the members of the house of God. Come on, somebody, if you're a kid, you can join Kia. If you're a teenager, you can join Heat. If you're a lady, you can join Women's Life Ministry. If you're, if you're a man, you can join Iron Man. Come on, somebody. There's something for everybody here at the church. There's something here for it. Woo. Come on, let's clap our hands. Let's welcome all the guests and all the visitors. Come on, Rock Church. I think we can do it just a little bit better than that. Yes. We're so honored that you came to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Let's just take a few moments, step out of our seats, and greet someone in Jesus' name.
Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, church. Anybody blessed and highly favored tonight? <laughs> I'm up here to do the Tuesday night offering and tithes and offering. Um, but I have a testimony from the events that were orchestrated by none other than the Lord last night. I'm talking about some powerful, powerful. I'm, it was probably one of the most powerful events that I've ever experienced in my walk with God. That's how powerful it was. Last night we were in a, the a leadership meeting last night and Brother Bass just delivered a word straight from heaven's kitchen. When a worshiper becomes a king. So meaty, so edifying. I mean, oh my word, it was just so good. And um, after that we just started praying and we started praying in the Holy Ghost and God just moved on, on all, the, all the leaders and we were just all praying, laying hands on each other and there was a powerful move of God. And after that, you know, we all were dismissed and my wife, she was going to make dinner. Well, she was headed home, but I, I usually go to the bridge on, on weekdays when I can. And I went to the bridge right here, crossing over to, um, right here to the bridge right here, going to cross over to North Fort Myers. And I was going up the bridge and I seen this young lady and she was, she was on a, she was on a, like on a, under a light pole, but she was at the top of the bridge. You can see it right there. But she was sitting on the other side of the concrete. And as you can see, there's no barriers. There's nothing. Basically, all she had to do was let go and fall. And that was like a, probably like a 300 foot free fall. She was trying to commit suicide. But I didn't know that at first. So, Brother Bass, I started, you know, thinking about how you said you got to be spirit led. You got to have that spiritual discernment. You can't be purpose driven. And as I was going up, I started, you know, I was like, I seen other people, there was a lot of people walking back and forth. And as I seen the lady, I just started looking and I was like, something is not right. I just felt that little nudge. So I went to the other side of the bridge, which is like a, a mile. And then lo and behold, when I'm coming back up the bridge, my brother's coming down the bridge and I didn't even know he was gonna be there. So I'm like, hey, and I just went and shook his hand because I said, good job, good job. We're both in, you know, trying to get more healthy. And as, as I went back up, I seen her, she was still there, and she had like a, a book, but I wasn't too sure if it was a Bible, and she just had it clutched. She had it clutched, and she looked all distraught, and I looked at her, and I was like, nah. I was like, man, that was my first thing. To, I usually, like, I always start talking to him, but, you know, there was people going around, and I didn't want to look like, you know, I was talking, trying to talk to a lady or something like that, because, you know, um, and as I, as I went down, I still felt that nudge. And I told my brother, I called him on the phone because I seen that he had his, um, his AirPods on. And I told my brother, I said, bro, can you check out, there's a lady that I seen on top. He goes, I said, did you see her? She was sitting on the side of that railing right there. And then he goes, yeah, I seen her. I said, can you make sure that she's all right? Because I was gonna go to my business and I was gonna go and you know, pick something up. And I was supposed to go home and go get something to eat. <laughs> I was trying to hurt her. But, um, yeah, so then um, when I get to my, my shop, next thing you know, my brother calls me and he goes, hey, um, the lady you were talking about, yeah, she was trying to, she's trying to commit suicide. And I'm like, all right, you know how we do it, search and rescue 24-7, oh, yeah. 365 days a year, we are on call. So I just told Brother Donnelly, I called him, I said, Brother Donnelly, are you on call? Ring, ring, ring. Brother Donnelly goes, hello, <laughs> hello, Brother Liv. I go, Brother Donald, you on call? He goes, yeah, what, what, what's going on? Let's go, where are we gonna meet? <laughs> I love Brother Donald. Oh man. So then, as, as Brother Donald, I, I tell him, she's at, there's a lady that she's trying to commit suicide. He goes, okay, well, where do we meet? Where? I said, she's at, the foothill of the, of the, she's at the foot of the bridge right there when we're crossing over to North Fort Myers. And he lives like five minutes away. And I was actually like, probably like five minutes away. And I also, I called my wife, and she was like, are you going to come and eat? I said, woman, you, I got meat that you know not of. <laughs> no, I didn't say all that. You know? <laughs> my wife needs to do the will of my father. Nah, but, nah, she was halfway cooking it. 
And it was, you know, whatever. I just told her, don't worry about that. Let's, I need you to come down right now. Because I needed a, a woman to, like, to minister to her. So when we get there, my brother, he was there. He stayed talking to her. Because I told her, can you just make sure that she don't go nowhere? Because I didn't want her to, you know, end up, you know, going back up there and jumping or anything. So then after that, I get there. And as soon as I see her, I see that she was, like, all, like, just so much pain, so much, like, anxiety, depression. Like, you could just look at her and just feel her pain, feel her sorrow, feel her turmoil. And I just started, I said, is that all right? I didn't even ask. I just said, is that all right if I pray for you? And I said, I didn't even, I just said, my name is Brother Leo. I'm from the Rock Church, and I'm here to let you know I'm here. God's here with you. And right now, and I'm going to start praying for you. And I started, I laid my hands on her, and she started shaking. She started shaking. She started shaking. I started rebuking that demon of suicide, that demon of depression, that demon of addiction. Because, you know, we got Bible for that. The Bible says you shall lay hands on the, on the sick and they shall be healed. You shall, you know, in my name they shall cast out devils. So as I was doing that, she just, she just said, she just, oh, like, oh, oh, I, I feel so, I feel so. She felt the Holy Ghost. She felt the Holy Ghost. So then as I was doing that, I'm finished praying and then, then Sister Jeanette comes. And Sister Jeanette just goes and embraces her. She didn't even talk to her. She just went and started hugging her. And the lady started hugging her, and they were just crying. And that's the love of God. That's the love of God. She, that lady needed to feel that love. She was so bound in chains and shackles. And she started hugging her, and they were weeping. And I was just praying, and the Holy Ghost, right there in front of everybody, I said, yeah, y'all want to come? We can pray for y'all too. So... As we started doing that, then Brother Donnelly gets here. And Brother Donnelly, I said, go ahead. Brother Donnelly started ministering and talking to her. They sat down. And we told her, there's only one way. There's only one way. The Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. She said, I've been waiting for this all my life. I've been told so many other things, but I feel the power. I feel the power of God. I've never felt that before. I've never felt that before, but I want it. I want it. I wanted my kids to come with me. I want my husband to come. He's on, he's, he's a drunk, he drinks, he's on drugs, but I know that God can do it. I told her, this is what she told me. This is what she told me. Right before, right, right, right when I was talking to her, she, I, she, I said, so um, what's going on? I'm, are you all right? And she goes, I was up there, and I told God, I said, Lord, if you're real, send me someone. She said, Lord, if you're real, send me someone. And let me tell you, in 20 minutes, she had five people ministering to her. She had five people ministering to her. She said, I know God's real. I know God's real. And she went. She obeyed the gospel message. She got baptized in his name. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all she kept on saying was thank you. I feel so much joy. I feel liberated. That's what we're here for. That's what we're all here for. That's what we're all here for. The Bible says when we receive the Holy Ghost, that we shall be witnesses, witnesses. All right, am I in the book? Not only that, Matthew, I was, show, I was telling Brother Donnelly about Matthew 28, 19. It's like God just showed me like something. I mean, you could take, I know we usually use it for obeying the commandments, but that is a commandment. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. But what I was, gonna, what I was looking at was when it says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have commanded you and lo I am with you always even into the end of the world so when God's inside of you what did Jesus came to do he came to seek and save the lost and he was always observing he was always walking in the spirit brother Bass Bishop Bass always and that's how we gotta be we can't just be walking by people and just you don't know what they're going through 
They might be on the verge of suicide. Today might be their last day. Tomorrow might be their last day. Life is a vapor. Once you're here and then you're gone. And we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Because this soul moves on and it's eternal. And we're either going to go end up in heaven or we're going to end up in hell. So that's what we got to do. We got to give that gospel. And I just want to say one more thing. Brother Donnelly, you're apostolic. Sister Lil, you're apostolic. Priscilla, you're apostolic. Sister Jeanette, you're apostolic. They're on call. They're on call. Rock Church, all of us are apostolic. Come on now. All of us are apostolic. And we have been called for this purpose. We can never forget that. And we got to be led by the Spirit. We got to be led by the Spirit. Ushers, you can come forward as we pray for the Tuesday night offer, tithing and offering. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you're doing, Lord. Thank you for giving us this opportunity just to be in your presence, Father. Lord, we know that our righteousness is as filthy rags, Father. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, Lord, for the blood that you, you shed on Calvary, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your long suffering towards us, Lord. Lord, we ask you to help us, Lord. Strengthen us, guide us, and lead us, Father. We want to walk with you and talk to you hand in hand, face to face, Father. We give you all the praise and glory, Father. We ask you to bless this offering, Father, that you bless it, break it, multiply it, Lord. Bless the hands of the giver. Bless the fruit of their labor, Father. Rebuke the devourer in the mighty name of Jesus. We give you all the honor, Lord, to the only wise God with dominion and power and majesty forever. Let's worship as we give.
great praise. If God's been good to you, somebody praise him according to his excellent greatness. Somebody praise him for his mighty acts. Yeah! When I think about Jesus, what he's done for me, when I see this, I always say, set me free. Can dance, 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 dance. Can dance, 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 dance. I can dance, dance, dance. Hey! What it's done for you When I think about Jesus How he say brought you through Can run, 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 run Can run, run, run Say I can run, run, run Hey, Lord tonight hey, to give God praise apostolics know how to worship on a Tuesday night apostolics hey to mess up and have some church. One, two, three, go! Hey! Go ahead, take about 60 seconds uh, and praise him in the dance. Yeah. Somebody praise him. Somebody praise him in the balcony. Somebody shout in the balcony. Yes. To God be the glory. Y'all help me see it tonight.
on, I wish somebody would reach back uh, for just a moment and remember uh, the way he brought you out uh, and remember how he brought you over uh, and remember how he took you through tonight. Oh, let's clap our hands and give God our best praise tonight. Come on, if God's been good to you, put those hands together. Oh, my God. This is apostolic church tonight. I said, this is apostolic church tonight. High five about eight people on the way to your seat. Tell them I'm apostolic tonight. Tell them I'm apostolic. I'm apostolic. I'm apostolic. I'm a one God apostolic, tongue talking, holy rolling, a heaven bound believer in the liberated power of Jesus' name. I'm apostolic. Oh, hallelujah. You can be seated for just a few moments tonight. Let me say a great big welcome to all of our guests that are in the building with us tonight. Would you help me one more time, Rock Church? Come on, let's give a great big round of applause. Come on, I need your hands to help me make some noise tonight. For all of our guests that are here, for those that are streaming online with us tonight, thank you for tuning in and being a part of what God is doing in this house. We are in the middle, I'm just going to call it, of Corona Revival. We don't die, we just multiply. I just... Why? Because we're apostolic. I'm telling you, God's been blowing our minds. It has been nonstop revival and miracles and testimonies. And uh, I'm so excited about the miracle that happened last night. My God, how many of you thank God for that testimony? How many of you will help me continue to pray for our brand new sister, Nicole? that God would finish the work he's begun in her life. So excited about what God is doing. And uh, how many of you were here Sunday and blessed by what God did in this sanctuary? I'm telling you, it, it has been an incredible weekend. And then last night, we had our monthly uh, leadership slash directors meeting. And we had the privilege of having Bishop Bass with us last night in our meeting. How many of you that were there were blessed by what God did in that place? And uh, it was absolutely powerful. Now, I want you to listen closely to me tonight because if you're here, you got a special opportunity tonight. What Bishop Bass taught us last night was so powerful, so transformative. I, I felt like it would just be a shame if only the people that were in that director's meeting were able to hear uh, what God gave us. And so we have an audio version of it recorded. And if you're here tonight in this service, now if you're watching online, I'm sorry. Uh, you can still get it, but if you're here tonight, you can get a copy of the CD at no cost because I want you to have it. I want you to have it. And all you need to do tonight, if you want a copy of that CD, is stop at the bookstore after the service. They'll take your order and they'll mark it at zero cost tonight only. If you're not here tonight and you want it, you can still get it. You're just going to have to purchase the CD. But I am asking all of you to get a hold of that CD and uh, let the word of the Lord just saturate your spirit. Amen? And uh, we are so privileged tonight to have both Pastor and Bishop Bass with us in the service tonight. All the way from Ocala, Florida, my dear friend and my neighbor, Pastor Bass, has been a friend from day one that we came to Florida. And I love and appreciate his family, their heritage and the powerful way in which God is using them to reach Central Florida. And we are just, I mean, uh, for him to have taken time out of his busy schedule and the, the importance of his responsibilities at home to come all the way down and be here with us tonight means so much 
to this house. And we're honored that you're here. I'd like him to just come and greet the congregation tonight. Would you help me put your hands together and honor this great man of God? That's good. Let's stand. Give a great ovation. Honor this great man of God. Come greet us tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. You may be seated. I got to say, and I'm not just saying this because I'm standing in this pulpit because I am in Fort Myers. I'm saying this because I mean it. I love the Rock Church of Fort Myers. I, I encourage our church. I push, I press. Whenever there's a special meeting here, a special function, I encourage our people, get out of Ocala, go to the Rock Church, go experience that place, hear the Word of God, worship with them, this church is blessed with an incredible man of God and his family. Amen. And it is a privilege of mine to count your pastor as my friend. And we are, as I said last night, we're about the same age. I think I maybe have a couple of years on him. But I look up to him as an inspiration, as someone who inspires and challenges me. And I appreciate his uh, friendship and his influence in my life. It's also really awesome to be here with my dad tonight. This is the second time in a month that I have been able to be with him on one of his speaking engagements. Normally he is traveling all over the country and here and there and I was able to be with him in Memphis last month and then able to be here tonight and I appreciate my dad who is also my pastor my bishop and I appreciate him very very much love him and it's great to be here tonight with him as well give honor to all the ministry that are here I've been doing a lot of studying and teaching at home on the book of Acts because as my father has always said and others have said you get what you preach and uh, thank God for the book of Acts, because when we preach Acts, we get a book of Acts revival. In Acts chapter 16, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I mean, you name it, you can find it in Acts chapter 16. It starts off with a young man being introduced, a young preacher talking about him. And then an update is given on the revival that's going on. You have a lady who is being a blessing to the man of God. She's ministering to him. And then you have a woman who is really a, a wolf in sheep's clothing with the spirit of the age that has to be cast out by the men of God. You have a whole host of things that are going on. You have this lady being delivered from this spirit. She's a fortune teller. And her... her um, Pimp, shall we say, <laughs> did not like uh, what they did, taking away their income. I call them the local mafia. And uh, the local mafia didn't like it, so they, they go tattling to the local leaders about these preachers. Hey, they're stirring up trouble. They're causing problems. And so Acts 16 is a lot like Acts 2020. It's a lot of stuff going on. As a result of the lies that were told on Paul and Silas, they find themselves in prison. They find themselves in stocks and bonds, their backs having been beaten. And at this moment, it would have been a great time for Paul and Silas to begin to feel sorry for themselves. It had been a great opportunity for them to say, you know what, maybe we, maybe we did push a little bit too hard. Maybe we were a little bit too vocal. Maybe we should just sit back. As a matter of fact, Paul could say, you know what? My rights have been violated. I am a Roman and they should have never beaten me. They should never have done to me what they did. Tell you what, let's just sit back here and endure the night in this jail cell. And in the morning, we'll go plead our case. We'll go let them know we have rights. We, we have rights and we, we can't be kept here. 
But that is not the approach that Paul and Silas had. The Bible says that at midnight that they prayed and sang praises unto the Lord. And it wasn't a quiet prayer and it wasn't a quiet song because the Bible said the prisoners heard them. Hallelujah. You see, the attitude of Paul and Silas was not one of just surviving a night in jail. It wasn't an attitude of just getting by. They said, we're not going to just survive, but it is time to thrive. We're not just going to make it through a bad season, but we are going to have revival. We are going to see God do some incredible things, or we're going to die trying. You know the story, there was a great earthquake, a great shaking, and there, the Bible says that all the doors were opened and every prisoner was loosed. And then I see the most amazing thing happen. The jailer who had put them there began to fear for his life, and he was going to kill himself. And Paul says, hey man, don't hurt yourself, we just had song service. We ain't started preaching yet around here. He said, we're all still here. Now that's amazing that all these prisoners who were loosed did not leave. Could it be the fact was they found more freedom on the inside of that jail than they would have ever had on the outside of that jail? They found the freedom inside of the prison like no freedom they had ever known before. And I tell the church tonight, as I know your pastor has surely told you, that in this time and season of craziness, if we'll not have a mindset of just surviving or just getting by, if we'll have a mindset of revival, a mindset of worship, a mindset of prayer, we'll see people loosed, we'll see people set free, They'll find a freedom and a liberty they've never known before. Hallelujah. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Give Him worship and glory. Glory to God. So good to be here. I love you. I appreciate you. Love you so much, Pastor Williams. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for your hospitality. Love you, my friend. One more time, let's thank God for Pastor Bass tonight. Amen. If you would stand with me all over the house as we prepare for the entrance of the word of the Lord into this place. I, uh, it is my privilege to bring to this desk a, a man whose ministry truly has impacted my life almost from the inception of my born-again experience at a very... Uh, young age, uh, the age of 14, I repented of my sins, was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And within the first year of uh, being born again, I was introduced to Bishop Bass's ministry at a conference in California, PSR. And uh, I remember, I could tell you what he preached I could preach half the sermon still. And uh, I knew of him as a young boy from the hood sitting on a pew. And if you would have told me at 14 years old that one day God would pull me out of the hood and I would be pastoring the greatest people on the planet Earth. In the middle of a church service like this, and introducing Bishop Bass to come and preach. I would have never believed you. But yet, here it is. Because God does all things well. We are so delighted to have him in this house. I love you, Bishop Bass. I appreciate who you are, your friendship to me. And we are ready to obey the Holy Ghost tonight. We want you to come and give it to us with both barrels. Would you put your hands together one more time and give God a great praise for Bishop Bass tonight. 
Somebody make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come on, a joyful noise. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. I, um, the Bible teaches us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands and to serve the Lord with gladness. I decided a long time ago that I was going to serve God with gladness. The reason, one reason why is I read over in the book of Deuteronomy where the Lord told Israel, he said, because you served me not with joyfulness and gladness of heart. He said, I'm going to let you serve your enemy in hunger, in thirst, in famine, in all things. And I decided a long time ago that's not an acceptable alternative to me. I decided I'm going to serve him with gladness. I'm going to put a smile on my face. I'm going to rejoice. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Ah, right, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. I am delighted to be here tonight back at The Rock. I certainly appreciate and I give honor to your good pastor and the first lady of this church. Also, Brother Isaac and Brother Judah, we give them the entire family honor. We appreciate them and their work in the kingdom of God. That meeting would probably be 30 years or better ago that he was talking about. And uh, back then, I was a lot younger. And my hair was black. <laughs> and it had not gone into economic recession. But uh, at any rate, uh, we are delighted to be here. I am especially thrilled to be uh, have my son with me. I love him very dearly. Thank God for the work that he is doing in the kingdom of God. Amen. I want to direct your attention tonight to the book of Proverbs chapter 22. And I am going to read one verse of scripture. Verse number 13. Proverbs 22 and 13. I felt this evening the Lord would have me direct your attention to this passage and this message. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. The slothful man says, there's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. I want to preach to you a few minutes tonight on this subject, the bondage of excuses. Amen. The bondage of excuses. Everybody shout amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The Bible gives us the statement of the slothful man. When you look at the definition of the word slothful, it means lazy. The synonyms that could be used uh, for the word slothful is that of a sluggard or indolent, one who is indolent. So what we understand by definition about the sluggard is that he is not a self-starter. To the sluggard or to the slothful man, one day is as good as another. This individual assumes that what he does not do today can just as easily be done tomorrow. Because the sluggard does not understand the value of time or the meaning of of seasons. His basic 
philosophy is this, to live for the moment and let the future take its own course. So in reality, what we have where the slothful man is concerned essentially is this, that he is one who does not want to take responsibility for his own actions. Amen. That is the essential problem with the slothful man. It's sad that we live in a world where this is becoming a greater problem in the society that we currently are a part of. Sad to say that today our society is plagued with this same attitude. In fact, I am personally convinced by my observations that it is practically in epidemic proportions simply because we live in a society and a world where no one, it appears, wants to take responsibility for their own action. Now, I love Acts chapter 2 because Acts chapter 2 is talking about us. That identifies who we are. The, the day of Pentecost, the message that was preached by the Apostle Peter, whenever we reach verse number 36 and verse 37, verse 38, where as he preaches and declares that this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their hearts and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. However, many people fail to read one more verse, to go one step further, because when you get to verse number 40, the Bible tells us with many of the words did he testify and exhort saying, amen, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So the message on the day of Pentecost was not complete at verse number 39. It was not over with at verse 39. In fact, there was a great amount of preaching that continued on after verse 38 and verse 39. And while we don't have all of the words stated in the balance of the message, what we do have is the summation of what he said. And the summation was this, save yourselves from this untoward generation. What is that scripture telling us? That scripture's making it very clear that every single person in this house is responsible for your own salvation. Amen. You have a personal responsibility to your salvation. If you are lost, it will not be your mama's fault. If you are lost, it will not be your daddy's fault. If you are lost, it will not be your pastor's fault or your first lady's fault, but it will be your own fault because you are responsible to save yourself. You got to get up on Monday morning and say, I am going to live for God today. You've got to get up on Tuesday morning and say, I am going to live for God today. You wake up on Saturday morning and you say, I'm living for God today. Oh, hallelujah. You can't wait for somebody to do your praying for you. You can't wait for somebody to do your worshiping for you. 
You are responsible to pray for your own salvation. You are responsible for your own worship when you come to the house of God. Amen. In fact, here's what's interesting. When you read the entirety of the New Testament, from verse number 40 of Acts chapter 2, throughout the balance of the New Testament, you are going to find over 40 references to your personal responsibility. Over 40 times are you going to find references to what you have to do, to what I have to do. I'm not reading all of them tonight, but here's a few of them. Yield yourselves unto God. Give yourself to fasting and prayer. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms. Hey, when nobody is around and there's no choir to help promote worship and there's no band to play and to get your feet to move them, sometimes you got to speak to yourself. Sometimes you got to sing a song. Sometimes you got to sing your own spiritual song in the midnight hour. Come on. You want God to work it out? That means you got to be willing in the midnight hour when you're by yourself to go ahead and sing praises unto God. He said, submit yourselves one to another. Withdraw yourselves from every brother who walks disorderly. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. And then last but not least of my examples tonight, he said, building up yourselves, praying in the Holy Ghost. What are you saying, preacher? I'm trying to tell every one of us here tonight that none of us have an excuse. We have our own personal responsibility. You can blame that person for saying something to you that, you, that they should not have said, but it will never stand in judgment. Woo, hallelujah. Somebody said, what do you need to live for God? I'll tell you what you need. You need some thick skin. You can't be thin-skinned and live for God. You need some thick skin. You got to be willing to take the punches. You have got to be willing to to take the attack of hell. You have got to be willing to be called whatever the world wants to call you. Because you made your mind up, I'm saving myself. I'm saving myself. Amen. You know what's amazing is the one thing that we are instructed in Scripture not to do is usually the thing that we try to do for ourselves. The one thing he told us not to do was to avenge yourselves. Amen. Don't avenge yourself. Hallelujah. The Lord said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Amen. And I'm just going to insert this right here. You want to deal with bitterness? Let me tell you what bitterness is. Bitterness is unfulfilled revenge. Amen. Bitterness is unfulfilled revenge. When you carry bitterness in your heart, it's the realization, I can't do anything about this situation, but if I could, I would. Lord, I feel like preaching here tonight. Amen. But the Lord said, you leave that alone, I'll take care of it. That's my job. Your job is save yourself. 
Save yourself from bitterness. Save yourself from anger. Save yourself from sin. Save, oh, hallelujah. Amen. In a society that is constantly looking for someone else to blame for their problems and their misfortunes in life, we really need a generation of apostolics that will rise up and assume responsibility for your life and for your future. Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. If you're apostolic, you'll take responsibility. Well, hallelujah. Being apostolic is more than running the aisles. It's more than leaping for joy. It's more than shouting and dancing all night. Being apostolic is... Woo, hallelujah. Amen. So let's, make, let's get back to the slothful man. Because the slothful man is lazy. Now remember the verse I read. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Because the slothful man is a lazy man, he creates an imaginary problem that excuses him from doing what he should be doing and justifies his staying in the house or the state or the place that he is in. Amen. That's the problem with the slothful man. And as a result, he lives in the bondage of his excuses. He lives in the prison of his imaginary problem. He lives in the bondage of the excuse that he has created for not getting out of where he is, taking responsibility. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. I feel Holy Ghost all over this place here tonight. You got you to gotta make up your mind. I'm not living behind the bars of excuses. I'm not going to live in the bondage of an imaginary problem. Amen. I'm telling you tonight what I feel in the Holy Ghost. That I'm preaching to some people in this house that you are living in the bondage of your excuses. But I have not come here tonight to just preach about your problem. Nor am I really going to preach about your excuses. But what I've come to tell you tonight is there is not a lion in the streets. And it's time for you to come out of the prison that you are in and be free. Free from your fear. Free from your inhibitions. Free from your doubts. Free from your unbelief. Oh, hallelujah. You know what I feel like doing here tonight? I feel like slaying some lions. I believe that before we leave here tonight, there ought to be lions' blood flowing all over this altar, flowing all over the floor because some people made their mind up. I'm not going to let myself live in the bondage of my excuses any longer. I'm coming out. I'm coming out of my place where I've lived in bondage. I can be what Jesus wants me to be. In fact, I'm going to adopt the words of the Apostle Paul. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Whoo, hallelujah. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote some interesting words in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, verse number 4 is what we call a parenthetical statement. That parenthetical statement that simply means 
that it was not in the original, but that it was placed there to create a better flow of thought by the translators of the Bible and to help you understand more so the thought or the precept or the concept that is being explained. And so here's what you have to understand when you read verse number four. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, remember, that being a parenthetical statement, you have to realize that when he said that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our first uh, order of business, the first thing that's important to us is not what many of us have referred to as the pulling down of strongholds. That's not what we're supposed to be looking at. What we have to see here is that that statement is explaining what is about to be said. And what is being said in verse number five is this, casting down imaginations. So what he's trying to tell us is that our imaginations that we have are our first and greatest battle that we have in living for God. The first stronghold that you need to use your weapon of warfare with and against. The first stronghold, amen, that you need to tackle is that thing called the imagination of your mind. You got to cast it down. You got to cast it down. You got to make, oh, hallelujah. The sister was up here tonight talking about the ladies' life ministries. And she was saying, you got to get rid of that fear. What I'm preaching about is exactly what she was referencing. That fear will cause you to imagine in your mind, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I'm not, ha- I don't have the talent. I don't have the ability. Oh, hallelujah. What am I going to do? What can God do with me? It's the imagination of the mind. The devil wants you to believe uh, that you don't have what it takes. But if you'll cast down that imagination, it'll help you understand uh, that God's got greater places for you to go. God's got greater things for you to do. But you've got to come to a place where I'm going to take a hold uh, of the imagination. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Because most of us, most of us have at one time or another in our life had to deal with an imaginary lion. Huh? I said we've had to deal with an imaginary lion. We had in our mind, we imagined that that which was in the streets, that if I go out there, I'll be consumed, I'll be destroyed. If I worship like I want to, people are gonna make fun of me. If I say I'm called to preach, they're gonna make fun of me. Amen. If I get up and I shout when the preacher's preaching, people are gonna call me names. If I live the way this preacher says that I'm supposed to live, all my friends and my co-workers gonna call me Holy Joe. And they're gonna go around telling everybody he's a holier than thou. I'll tell you what all of that is. That's just a bunch of imaginary lions that's trying to keep you on your pew, that's trying to keep you locked down, trying to keep you from being everything that God wants you to be. Hallelujah. What's the message? You need to come out of where you are. Get out of the place you are in. Make up your mind that there's no imaginary lion going to keep me locked down. I know what I'm preaching right tonight. Can I get a witness? Amen. When Jesus got off the boat in Mark chapter 5, he had crossed the Sea of the Gadarenes. 
come to the land called Gadara. And as he climbed off the boat, the Bible said immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces and neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. We understand further in the story that there was a legion of devils that was in this man which could number anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 that was in that man. Amen. He had a real problem. You hear me? He had a real problem. He was bound by the powers of hell. But when I look at verse number 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. So I'm asking us a question tonight, and that is, if a man with a real problem, if a man with a real lion, if a man who was possessed of 6,000 devils, and those devils could not stop him from running to Jesus and falling on his face and worshiping Jesus, how much more ought we tonight who have been loosed, who have been set free, how much more ought we Amen. How much more ought we tonight who just have imaginary problems? Most of our stuff's just imaginary. Most of what we deal with is just the mind playing games with us. Oh, hallelujah. Don't you think for one minute that the devil won't take advantage of your mind that is open to plant thoughts to plant ideas, to plant doubts, to plant unbelief in your spirit, you gotta back up and say, wait a minute. That's an imaginary lion. That's an imaginary problem. I'm not living in the bondage of my excuses. I'm coming out of where I am. I'm gonna get my deliverance. I'm gonna become what Jesus wants me to be. Oh, I could never live like this preacher preaches that I ought to live. That's an imaginary lion. Huh? Amen. Oh, there's no way in the world that I can afford to pay tithes. That's an imaginary problem. Well, it got quiet right about them, but that's still a fact. Amen. Let me tell you my attitude on it. I can't afford not to. Huh? I said, I can't afford not to. I killed that lion a long time ago. I killed that lion when I was a teenager. When I was just a kid, I killed that lion. I made my mind up that I serve a God big enough and good enough. He'll take care of me. Amen. Here's a man with a real problem that did not let his real problem keep him from worship. And if a man with a real problem can't be kept from worship, how much more ought we who deal with imaginary problems ought to overcome that and go ahead and worship? Hallelujah. Y'all ready? Amen. David, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, it said that David departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 Men. Now that's a motley crew if you ask me. Whenever David looks at the crowd that's gathered with him, the only thing he can see is discontentment. 
Only thing he can see is people that are in distress. And all he can see is a crowd that's full of debt. Amen. But the preacher came to him and said these words. David, abide not in the hold, but depart and get into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. Why did the preacher come to David and say, abide not in the hold? Don't stay in this cave. It's because the preacher understood, David, you can't train these men to be fighters inside a cave. You can't fight battles in a cave. You can't have victory in a cave. David, if you're going to train this bunch to be a fighting force, you got to get out of that cave that you're in. You can't not use that as a hiding place. You got to get out of the bondage that you're in. Get out of that cave. Hey, Amen. We'll tell some of y'all here tonight you need to get out of the cave you're living in. Huh? I said, get out of that cave you're living in. You can't, you can't plant seed and cultivate a crop and reap a harvest inside a cave. You got to get outside the cave. You got to get in the field. Now, some of y'all not hearing me tonight. I've come to dig some of you up from where you are. I've come, to, I've come to reach out to you tonight to let you know that all you're doing is letting an imaginary problem hold you down. You're letting an imaginary lion keep you where you are. Get out. Get out. Get out of your cave. Come out of where you are and make up your mind. I'm going to be victorious. I'm going to fight some battles. I'm going to win some victories. I'm going to have a harvest. I'm moving forward in God. Amen. You can't stay inside the cave and grow. As long as you're in the cave, you'll still be in debt. As long as you're in the cave, you'll still be discontented. As long as you're living in the cave, you'll be in distress. The only thing a cave is good for is to give distressed people a place to live and to give dead indebted people a place to live and to give people that are discontented a place to live. But victorious people come out of where they are and they move to the field and they realize, I got to risk some things. I've got to risk some things. I've got to risk rejection. I've got to risk putting myself I got to risk making myself vulnerable. I don't want to knock on doors because if I knock on doors, they're probably going to reject me. They're probably going to tell me, listen, I want to tell you something tonight. You, somebody said, if I don't go out and try to win souls, will I go to hell? Well, I'm going to just tell you, I don't know that you will go to hell, but somebody will. I said, you may not go to hell because you don't knock doors or you don't give Bible studies or you don't try to reach the lost, but there might be somebody out there that you could reach that will go to hell because you don't get out of your cave. You don't get out of your bondage. You keep living behind your excuses. You find every reason. Come on, quit looking for excuses to not doing what you ought to be doing and make up your mind, I'm coming out, I'm coming out. I'm going to work with my pastor. I'm going to work with the first lady. I'm going to work with the church staff. Somebody clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus came to Jerusalem. And when he got to Jerusalem, it was a time of the feast of the Jews. And at Jerusalem, there was a uh, by the sheep market, there was a pool. And, and it was called the Pool of Bethesda. And in that, in that area where the pool was, it had five porches. And under those porches lay a great multitude of 
impotent folk. Amen. Unproductive. Incapable. Insufficient. They were impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease that he had. The Bible said a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. That when Jesus saw him lie, knew and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he asked the man a question. Will thou be made whole? The impotent man looked at Jesus and said, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another one steps down before me. That's not what Jesus asked him. He didn't say, what's your excuses, sir? Why haven't you been healed? Why haven't you been delivered? Why are you still laying on this bed? That's not what Jesus asked him. He asked him a question that only needed a yes or a no answer. That's all he needed was a yes or no answer. Will you be made whole? But the man had already developed a list of excuses. He said, first of all, I don't have anybody to help me. And you got folks that live their life with that mentality. Amen. Nobody helps me. Oh, help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, it's getting quiet here right now. Amen. We got to get past this entitlement mentality that everybody owes us something. That everybody owes me something. I got news for you, friend. Nobody owes you anything especially God. But I'm so glad he picked me up. I'm so glad he turned me around. I'm so glad he filled me with the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad he didn't have to do it, but thank God he did. Come on, anybody glad he picked you up out the Mary pit of sin? Set your feet on a solid rock. Anybody here tonight happy for what Jesus did for you? He said, I don't have anybody to help me. He said, when the water's being troubled, nobody's there to help me get in the pool. And he said, when I am trying, he said, somebody beats me to it. So his attitude was, I'm always the one last. I'm always the one left behind. Everybody else gets the blessings. Everybody else gets the healing. Well, hallelujah. Go ahead, Brother Bass, preach. Preach, you're doing all right. Somebody else gets the blessing before I do. Somebody else gets the deliverance before I do. Somebody else gets the healing before I do. Jesus did not ask him, what's your excuses? He said, what I want to know is, yes or no, would you be made whole? Jesus completely ignored his excuses. And I'm here tonight to tell you, make all the excuses you want. Jesus ain't listening. Come on now. Hey, I can preach something to make everybody run the aisles, but that's not what the Holy Ghost sent me here for tonight. The Holy Ghost sent me to pull somebody out of the place that you've been in because you've been living in the bars of excuses, the bondage of excuses. And God ain't listening to your excuses. He's not paying any attention to all your excuses. He looks at the man and says, take up your bed and walk. 
take up your bed. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Does that sound like personal responsibility to anybody here tonight? Does that sound like personal responsibility? He looked at the man and said, get up. Because I'm going to tell you, if you ever get out of where you are, you got to get up. Well, you got to get up. You know, Jesus, Jesus uh, come across a blind man one day, and, and, and the Bible said that, that he led him outside the city. You got to be willing to get out of where you are, the place you've been living in. The very place that he was at was places where Jesus had tried to perform miracles and they did not believe in the miracles he was performing. So Jesus had to get him out of where he was. And if for you to get your eyes opened up to what God wants to do in your life, you got to get out of where you are. You got to get past the place. You got to be willing to get up from where you are. He said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, when I read that, my little brain, when I read it, I have to ask myself the question. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Why didn't he just say rise and walk? Why did Jesus say, take up your bed and walk? Well, I don't have any biblical proof of this, but I know a little bit about human nature. And I know a little bit about how things function and operate in the world. Amen. When Jesus said, take up your bed, he knew and understood that that bed represented that man's bondage. And what Jesus did not want is somebody to come behind that man and find himself in the same bed. He didn't want somebody else. He didn't want that man to leave that bed for somebody else. Now, now I, if your pastor teaches differently, that's fine. You, you go follow him. But, but I, I don't know that I can buy into generational <laughs> generational curses. I don't know that I can fully buy into that idea, but what I can buy into because I see it is generational dysfunctionalisms. Grandpa passes it to Papa. Papa passes it to children. Children go on down to grandchildren. One generation after another lives the same way, lives under the same cloud, lives under the same lifestyle. Amen. I'm going to preach to some parents here tonight. Whatever your excuses are, you need to throw those excuses in the garbage so your children don't use the same excuse and your grandchildren don't use the same excuse. Take up your bed. I said take up your bed. Get out of where you are. Amen. But you don't understand, Brother Bass. You don't understand how long I've been dealing with this. Jesus don't care how long you've been living where you've been living. He don't care how long you've been in bondage. This man had been there for 38 years. But the day came that Jesus said, it's time for you to come out of your bondage. It's time for you to be delivered, to get out of that bed. Amen. Some of us need to take up our bed so our kids don't sleep in the same bed we've been sleeping in. Huh? Huh? Can I tell you what kind of attitude your children's going to have about church? It'll be the kind of attitude you have about church. If you're saying, I'm so glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of God, it won't be long before your children are saying the same thing. But if all you've got is an excuse about why you can't go to church, why you can't live for God, why you can't get this, why you're not blessed here, why you're always finding fault with everything, 
your kids are going to get the same attitude. Ooh, hallelujah. You can stand. I'm done. Well, not quite, but I'm almost there. Praise the Lord. You see, we create all kinds of excuses to justify not doing what we ought to be doing. Amen. We live in the bondage of excuses because when you start making excuses, you immediately are wrapped in the chains. And you know what your problem is? My problem, if I get involved in that, it's right here. It's an imaginary problem. And that is my first and greatest battle in living for God. I got to cast down that stronghold, that imagination. Amen. We got lions. See, so people got lions are living with. They got lions that they have created in their mind. Can I tell you tonight that the truth is this. It's not the imaginary lion without that ought to concern us. But it's the lion from within that's killing our opportunity to move up in God and to go forward and be in everything that God wants us to be. Spiritual slothfulness is nothing more than spiritual laziness. Amen. And spiritual laziness creates imaginary lions. And you start saying, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't go here, I can't go there. Come on, I'm, I'm preaching where we live tonight. I'm preaching right down where this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where reality sets in. I, I, listen, I, my Lord, we've had church here tonight. This has been incredible. But I feel in the Holy Ghost that there's some people sitting on these pews here tonight that you have been battling some long-standing problems. You have decided that you can never get delivered from depression. That you can never get set free from oppression. That you can never be what you really want to be got the imagination of the mind working over time. Let me just tell you what you got to do. You got to get out of that cave. Huh? Do you know what the prophet of God told David? The prophet of God said to David, said, arise and go to Judah. Amen. You know how to battle your imaginations? You need to go to Judah. You need to go to praise. You need to get an attitude of worship like you've never had in your heart and your mind. Because if you ever get bold enough to get cut loose in the Holy Ghost, ain't no devil in hell can hold you back. You ever get loose, amen, from that imaginary spirit and you're talking in tongues and the power of God flows to your life, it won't be long, friend. Ain't no devil going to stop you. Ain't no imaginary problem going to stop you. Your mind is made up. I'm moving up in God. I'm getting past where I am. While our front line tonight or whoever is going to be up here, our musicians, if you're here tonight, I feel like I feel like some people in this house, you need to come up here and slay some lions, leave them on the altar. Let lions' blood just flow all over this floor here tonight. Walk out of this place saying, I'm not taking this imagination with me anymore. I'm not taking these imaginary problems anymore. I'm rising above them. I'm getting beyond them because we've got, a, we've got a job to do. The church don't have time for people to be laid up in beds of excuses. The church needs everybody 
Pick up your bed. Let's go. We got revival to be had. We got souls to reach. We've got my, 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 hallelujah. We got a testimony to give. We got to reach a world that's going to hell. Hallelujah. The church cannot be burdened down with people that don't want to really be involved, that don't want to really do what should be done. Come on out. Come on out of your cave. Get out of your bed. Rise up. There's a work to be done. There's a world that needs God. We need to reach our world. I feel like some folks ought to come on in close. If you're here tonight and you don't have the Holy Ghost, you need to let the Holy Ghost work in your life. Let the Holy Ghost work in your life. Let the Holy Ghost make the difference. Let the Holy Ghost touch you in this place. Come on, you don't have to live where you've been living. You don't have to live where you've been living. You don't have to live in the place that you've been living in. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Come on, withholding nothing. I surrender all to you. Everything. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Come on, let's slay some lions here tonight. Come on, let's slay some lions. Let's slay some lions. Let's kill those imaginations. Let's kill the imaginary problems. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, church. I'm calling on you tonight. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. I give you all of me. Come on, come on. I'm calling on your rock, church. Look around you. There's people praying. There's people trying to get out of the bed they've been in. Jesus don't care how long you've been struggling with that problem. He just wants you to know. He just wants to know. Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to come out of where you are? weeping the Holy Ghost has touched some hearts there's some people tonight that wants to get out of where they are they want to get out of the bed that they've been in hallelujah 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 come on come on I'm telling you tonight it's the Holy Ghost right now deliverance is in the house Come on, deliverance is in the house. Deliverance is in the house. I give you all. God, I'm not leaving nothing else. I'm not leaving it on the table. Said I give. Yes. Come on, you don't have to be where you are. You don't have to live in the bondage. You got to get out of that cave. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Hallelujah. I'm going to be what Jesus wants me to be. I'm getting tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of being hung up where I am. I'm tired of being bound to this bed of excuses. I'm going to say yes, Lord. I want to be made whole. Yes, Lord. I want to be made whole.
Jones is in the house. Come on, there's deliverance here tonight. Come out of your cave. Get out of your bed. There's victory ahead. There's a whole new world ahead. There's a new life. Yes, 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 yes. Come on. You don't have to be found. You can be delivered. You don't have to be found. You can be delivered. You don't have to lay in that bed of excuses any longer. You can come out of where you are. Hallelujah. Get up, get up, get up, hallelujah, come on and get up from where you are and have victory, be made whole tonight, be made whole tonight.
give it all away Said I give you all of me Give you all of me Give you all of me Yeah All of me Give you all of me Give you all of me I give you all of me That's it, somebody. Come on, tonight God's trying to get our attention. Tonight the grace and the mercy of God is reaching for us. Tonight the love of God is reaching for us. Come on. Come on. Don't resist the Holy Ghost. Don't quench the Spirit in your life tonight. Oh, God. Come on. With holding nothing, Lord. God, I will not let you go until you change me. Until you bless me. Until you change my name, God.
are open as long as you want to pray tonight God bless you let's respect those that are still praying in this house in Jesus name give myself away give myself away 